If you haven't subscribed to Film Courage on iTunes, it's not too late. You can visit iTunes, click subscribe, and type in Film Courage. I am your co-host, Karen Warden. And I am the guy who has the honor of sitting across from Karen. Well, thank uh, you. Yes, indeed. My name is David Brannon. Actor Sam Levine is here in studio. Sam has over 50 acting credits on IMDb, and we're going to talk to him about how he books so much work, along with what it's like to audition and work with Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, yeah. excited to hear all of this. Uh, coming up right now on Film Courage, we have with us actor Sam Levine. His credits include Inglorious Bastards, I Love You, Beth Cooper, Freaks and Geeks, The Family Guy, Entourage, and much, much more. Sam... Thank you. Hello, Sam. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you guys you so, so much for having me. What a what a genuine pleasure this is. <laughs> this sounds like such a highbrow NPR type show, and I'm just going to bring it right into the gutter. Oh, I love it. I love Great. it. Great. Oh, I, I love man. when I introduce a guest, and, and we start off with a smile on our guest face as soon as I say the name. Um, and again, if you would like to interact with us on today's show, send your tweet to at Film Courage. Okay, well, Sam, let's start out. Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in the Garden State, Fort Lee, oh. New Jersey. Oh, very nice, very nice. Mm. And which, which part of New Jersey is that? Uh, Fort Lee is it's uh, northern Jersey. It's uh, right by Manhattan. Uh, there's okay. the the three main inlets from New Jersey into Manhattan is the George Washington Bridge, the Lincoln Tunnel, and the Holland Tunnel. And uh, the George Washington Bridge, uh, Fort Lee, is where that hits New Jersey. Okay. And how young were you when you developed an interest for acting and comedy? Um, that's a good question. I think I was, I'd always been kind of uh, fascinated by performing and everything, but I remember being scared uh, to perform when I was 10 years old or 11 years old. Uh, I was going to be in the, in the, yeah, no, I was going to be in the, in the school, my elementary school production of, uh, of A Christmas Carol. And I remember the, uh, the music teacher wanted me to play uh, Marley. But I was nervous. It's too many lines. I said, I don't, I don't want all those lines, and uh, I'd rather just be in the chorus. Okay. And then uh, somewhere between between that year, between fifth and sixth grade, I lost that fear and then mm. uh, demanded to be, well, I didn't demand, but I really wanted to be the lead in the, the following year's production, which was The Nutcracker, a non-ballet <laughs> version of The Nutcracker. That really just involved a lot of talking. Okay, interesting. Wow. Mm -hmm. It was very boring. Why, why do you love acting, and, and how did you become an actor? I love acting because it is so much easier than getting a real job. Let's be honest here. <laughs> um, I love acting because I'm a very expressive person. Um, I, I, I love the idea of, of characters, of uh, you know mimicry, of, of uh, just being someone else for however long. Um in, in another life, I might have made a good undercover cop if it weren't for the being short and Jewish and not strong. But um, uh, I was, I've always been drawn to performing, mm -hmm. so it was, for me, a, a very easy decision. And, and you started at a very young age in terms of your professional career. H how young were you started, and, and how did that come about? Uh, I initially, more so than wanting to be an actor, wanted to be a stand-up comedian. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was 11 years old in, uh, in 1993... Uh, the late uh, but wonderful comedian Richard Jenny mm -hmm. had uh, uh, an HBO comedy hour called Platypus Man mm -hmm. uh, that aired. And I watched that thing religiously. I taped it and watched it again and again and again and again. I couldn't believe how great it was. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought, oh, wait a minute. You can just get up on a stage, joke around for an hour, and people will like you? This seems impossible. <laughs> And uh, and so I wanted to become a stand-up, uh, based almost solely on that. And so I spent the next uh, year or so, uh, you know, putting together my own bad jokes, and I'd memorized all of uh, Richard Jenny's jokes from Platypus Man. And uh, I believe I actually performed in my sixth grade talent show, doing pretty much verbatim one of his bits from. Platypus Man, the, the Red Lobster sketch, or oh. not sketch, but the uh, Red Lobster material. Um, and uh, and then about uh, less than a little less than a year after that, I began um, playing my friend's bar and bat mitzvahs. Okay, mm. that was my next, yes, and a Lisa Kudrow. That's right, yeah, okay. Lisa Kudrow was, was, was in the audience, if you will, at one of these uh, <laughs> bar mitzvahs I was playing. And, uh, and Friends was in its first season, it was 94, 
And uh, and afterwards she came up and said, hey, that was really good. You know, are you an actor? I said, no. And she said, you really should be. You seem like you have the timing for it. Wow. I don't know, you might want to consider pursuing that. So I went home and I was like, Ma, Lisa Kudrow from Friends, yeah. the hit show Friends, said I should be an actor. we we got to get on that. Let's do this thing. <laughs> Very cool. Well, that leads me into my next question because, you know, I know so many people who come from backgrounds where there's a lot of pressure to be something great, something with a title that equals a, a good living. Mm-hmm. And then those people tell their parents, hey, guess what? I want to study acting. You mm-hmm. know, I want to move to L.A. And, and take classes. Now, I realize you started at a young age, but did anyone in your life uh, attempt to talk you out of being an actor or, or comedian? Uh, yes, both of my parents attempted to, <laughs> okay. and that lasted, I'll tell you exactly how long it lasted, less than a week. Uh, uh, so I said I want to be an actor. We went and bought uh, Backstage Magazine, okay. which is for New York actors. It's kind of the, the, the New York Bible of mm-hmm. weekly publishing. Um, and so uh, we found an ad in there for a manager in New York who managed specifically kids who did stand-up. Oh, wow. And we, I went in to meet with him. And my mother thought I was just going in to meet with him to rep me as a stand-up. But then he also wanted to represent me as an actor. Hmm. And uh, my mother was not keen on that idea off the bat. Because she was aware of how difficult it is, you know, to be an actor at any age. <laughs> and, and you know, how often that pursuit will lead to nothing but heartbreak. Hmm. And uh, And so I went home and my parents said, we'll discuss it. You know, we're not, we'll think about it. And uh, and then that either that night or, or the next day, the manager called and said, uh, "Look, uh, you don't have to commit to anything. I just I really want to send Sam on this one audition. You know, it it does. It's not going to bind you guys to me. You haven't signed anything. I just want him to go on this audition, see how he does." Mm-hmm. And my parents said, "Ah, fine. We'll let you go on one audition. We still haven't made up our minds yet." So I go on the one audition for this toy commercial, uh-huh. and I book it. Wow. And then they were uh, had no problem with me uh, wanting to pursue this uh, this whole acting uh, Michigas. And I'm not, I'm not sure. And how old were you? Because you were incredibly young, weren't you? Uh, I was I, 13 or 14. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. And you know, so many actors they make it look easy. Yet you hear behind the scenes that so many great people question themselves and their talent. Do you question yourself as an artist? Uh, anyone who doesn't question themselves as an artist is a liar. Okay. Um, I oh I always I hate everything I do. I well no that's How not so? true. I hate most of the stuff I do. I, I don't know because I'm I'm my own harshest critic. Okay. Who isn't? Mm-hmm. Uh, everything that I've done that I watch, I of course will always look and go. Oh why did I do that? Why didn't I do that differently? And then uh, I realized recently that I probably did do it differently, but the director did not like that take. Okay. So the only pro- the only thing I can ever visualize where I'd be in a film or something where I see it later on and go, I made all the right choices, is something that I would either have to direct or edit. And that's not going to happen anytime soon, so I'm stuck with hating a lot of the choices I make. <laughs> How do you go about preparing for a character, and what's your process? Um, you know, I, I don't want to belittle people who use a process. Okay. Um, because I, I've always said uh, everyone gets to that point their own way, and there's no one way that's right versus another way. For me, my process most of the time is very, I read the lines off of the page, you know, in, in my head as I'm, you know, preparing for the role, and I just know how they should sound in my head when they're said out loud. And... When I say them out loud, I try to make them sound as best as I could to the way I heard them in my head. Okay. Um, you know, I've, and that's that. That's mostly though for for comedy. If I'm doing something heavier, I will put obviously a little more thought and and energy into it before I, you know, go to do the scene. But I, I mean, you know, there's there's the there's the old story <laughs> from uh, from the set of Marathon Man. Okay. Um, stop me if you've heard this one, listeners. Um, <laughs> where uh, uh, I, I don't know if you know the movie. It's a great movie with Dustin Hoffman and Lawrence Olivier and Roy Scheider. Uh, and uh, and so there's this great climactic scene with Lawrence Olivier, this living legend, and Dustin Hoffman, who at the time, it's late 70s, you know, young young kid. And um, and Hoffman's character is supposed to have been awake and running for his life all night, mm. basically before he encounters Olivier. His character, and uh, 
and so they get to set that morning and Hoffman looks terrible and <laughs> Olivier says why do you look so awful and Hoffman says well you know it's, I'm, in this scene I'm supposed to be you know, awake all night and running around so I stayed up all night and I'm just kind of I'm going crazy <laughs> and Olivier just looks at him and he says that's why they call it acting my dear boy <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so you're not going out and and you know living a, a, you know w- whatever that character is. You're not trying to live it and, and do the whole. No, I am not a method, method. actor. Uh-huh, that's what no, I was no. looking for. Yeah, I know a number of method actors, and I have admiration for them. Okay. Um, because that I know that's something I could never do. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, everyone's process is different. So mm-hmm. I I I feel my process is no more right or wrong than any sure. other. You know, we have a shout out coming in from Twitter from Justin Lyon. Yeah. He um he wants to throw you some high fives, Sam. So okay. he says, uh, keep up the good work. Well, thank you very much, Justin. High very five nice. right back at yeah, you. Absolutely. Okay. Now, what what are your current goals in acting, and and do you feel like you've given your best performance? Oh wow. Uh, all right, I'll take the first part of the question. <laughs> um, what are my goals as an actor? Um, I. Well, here's a good story. Um, uh. For Passover, the uh, the Jewish holiday of Passover, where we uh, retell the story of the the uh, slaves in Egypt uh, getting freed by Moses, which you do every year, you have to end that seder, the, the Passover seder, the big dinner, by saying next year in Jerusalem. That's sort of the goal when you end the seder every year. Whoever's running the seder says next year in Jerusalem. I've always thought you are aiming too high. We're not going to do the thing next year in Jerusalem. Why set these unattainable goals? I say next year in Cincinnati. Because we might actually do that. (laughs) That's how I've always felt. Mm -hmm. As such, my goals as an actor are not to win an Oscar or an Emmy or make $20 million a film. My goals as an actor is to support myself as an actor, regardless of whether I'm hugely famous or no one knows who I am. Mm -hmm. If I can keep putting food on the table by acting then I have met my goals. I truly have. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, again, easier than getting a real job. You see so many people that have attained a certain amount of success and they've lost their freedom. Mm -hmm. And they can't go to the grocery store anymore or or to a movie. Is is that something that you... Do you think the money is worth that? Or would you rather just make a comfortable living but be at a place where you have more (laughs) anonymity? Um, You know, that's a good question. And... I know uh, personally a handful of people who are unable to walk down the street, mm-hmm. and I don't envy that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's not that, that, that's too bad. You know, you can't just oh, I'm gonna go get some milk in the middle of the night and run out and grab milk and come back. No, they can't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that's something that I I really think about um, for me uh, because I don't I don't think I'll ever be that famous. And that's not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. I I like that I can still, for the most part, do all of the normal things in my life that I did before I became an actor. Okay. Um, really, the level I'm at right now is great because I, I typically get stopped at restaurants when I'm on dates. Okay, that's perfect. And that's when you want to get <laughs> harassed, right there. <laughs> oh, I'm a big fan. I loved your work on that. So, Raven, would you sign this napkin for my daughter? <laughs> Yes, I would. <laughs> right. Perfect. <laughs> and, and, and coming back, I mean, ha- have you given your best performance yet? Ah, uh, yes. So to come. Have I given my best performance? I hope not. Um, as proud of the work that I have done, uh, I feel like there is a, a lot more out there in my future. So what do you think is the best thing a director can do for an actor? <laughs> um... Wow, that's Open a, question. That is, <laughs> that is a slippery slope of a question. The best thing a director can do for an actor is be honest with them uh-huh. and be very willing to uh, work with the actor on the character, on the performance, um, and and be open to suggestion. Um, there, I've worked with a few. Uh, you know, directors over the years, one of whom I will not name uh, uh, specifically, but it literally, this is not this is not a joke, I in one take I did said the, and then in another take I said the and then afterward 
the director sent the script supervisor over to say, no, 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 you have to say the every time. Oh, okay. Tomato, tomato. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I said, really? Hmm. Yeah, that's what the director wants. Interesting. The internet, every pronunciation, uh, the pronunciation of every single word was important. Hmm. And when you are that uh, constricted, it some actors thrive in that. I'm not one who does. Hmm. Um, uh, and you know, then I then I've worked with other other directors who, say, say, if you hate the line, say whatever you feel comfortable with. Is what they'll say, you know. Do you have any suggestions? Any anything you think of to make the scene funnier, better, more true to the way you're trying to play the character? Go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. And for me, I'm very comfortable doing that. Um, but I also know other actors who prefer the first way, who prefer to have everything very rigid. And this is exactly what I want from you, exactly this way. And they will hit it every time. And uh, you know, it's it's. I, again, there's no really right way or, or best way to direct an actor. It's always a little bit different f- with every director and every job. Hmm, so maybe it depends on the relationship between the actors and the director. and uh, Definitely. Whether they know. need structure or whether they want more flexibility. Mm-hmm. You are listening to Film Courage. We broadcast live every Sunday, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on latalkradio.com. We are speaking with actor Sam Levine. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've mentioned um, before on the show, and I'm sure many people can vouch for this, is that, you know, time moves very quickly. And I've seen a lot of people, myself included, who come to L.A. or New York to become actors, and they slip into a party mode, mm-hmm. and they hang out with friends, and uh, they don't focus on their dream, and then time slips away. You get a little bit older, and life gets a lot harder. And then there's this realization that's like, wow, I'm this age and I'm still doing this? I can't believe this. Um, what do you think are some of the mistakes actors make when they get to L.A. or New York? Oh, boy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's hear it. Um, all right. I'm uh, oh, not going to win a lot of friends saying this. <laughs> David Cross, uh, the wonderful, wonderfully funny comedian David Cross, has a, a bit on one of his albums that he calls uh, he calls Los Angeles the 24-hour-a-day non-stop parade of self-delusion. And I'm not going to do the whole bit. I think you get the, the idea of it right there. <laughs> um, but I see a lot of that. I see a lot of people who... I, I have strong admiration for people who bust their ass trying to get themselves further in their careers. But at some point, if you're busting your ass day in and day out, and you've been doing it for years, and you haven't gotten even a half step closer to that next level, I have always wondered at what point do you have to make the decision to go, all right, maybe this isn't working out the way I thought it was. I'm going to start exploring this other thing. I'm not going to forget about the first thing, but I've got to look out for my future even a little bit. And I, I, I feel like not enough people maybe have that that little moment of, oh, I came out here to be an actor and I'm going to try, but at the same time I don't want to be 40 and broke. Um, so I I I mean, but I feel like I'm not being true. All right, I I'm, I don't want to keep telling other people's stories, but no, this is good. This is the um, good nuggets here. Well, oh. I uh, I listen to a lot of interviews myself, so <laughs> so I'm just going to regurgitate. Um, but then on the flip side. Mm-hmm. Here's uh, here's the the other argument. Uh, so Vin Diesel, when uh, when he was a young man, was a great admirer of Harrison Ford, and um, and he was working on some movie that Harrison Ford was in. I don't know if he was an extra or had one line or what have you, but he was on set with Harrison Ford, and he had he just loved this man. So he waits weeks and weeks, and finally finds the right moment gets Harrison Ford alone and says, listen, I I have to ask you, you have a career people would kill for. How did you do it? And uh, and Harrison Ford takes him aside. Says, I'll tell you how I did it. I moved to Hollywood in the 60s with five other friends. We all chipped in money. We got this house. And after the first six months, two of them left. After the first year, another two left. After a year and a half, the fifth guy left. I never left. Huh. Leaving was never an option for me. Wow. Okay. And uh, and that's how I feel about it. Leaving's not an option. So, um, you know, I- I'm not saying if it's not working out, give up, move back to your hometown. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
because I don't want to leave. And if you're here to act, you shouldn't leave because acting isn't in Duluth. It's here in Los Angeles or New York. Um, but, uh, you know, I just, I, I, I have a lot of friends who are in their 30s who can't afford to go see movies mm-hmm. because they're broke putting all they have into acting. And it's, it's only gotten tougher in the almost 11 years now that I've lived here. I moved to L.A. right at the very end of what was a very sweet time to be an actor. TV shows, uh, there were was almost no reality shows or, or game shows on television yet. That all started right, right at the end of 99, 2000. So TV work was plentiful. Uh, film work was uh, booming. The, the independent movies had real money to them back in those days now now they make movies for fifty thousand dollars um you know so it, it was it was a different time and it's only gotten harder every single year that i've been here so i i don't I, I'm, I wouldn't turn anyone away who wants to come to la to be an actor but i mean man it is an uphill battle mm-hmm. you know unless of course you are lucky enough to have some sort of video on the internet and <laughs> get plucked from obscurity and put into film that way. <laughs> I'm not naming names. Yeah, you know, keeping with what you're saying here, Sam, because, you know, I, I don't want to paint a total gloomy picture, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what are some of the key ingredients that, that you have to have or an actor should have um, that, that to help nurture your career, you know, to put you in a spot where, like, the, these are the things you need to have in place. What what, what actors out there, if, if they're just struggling and they can't find the next audition, next right? Job, what, what what do they need to have in place? Fair enough, and I and I apologize for painting such a gloomy no, picture. No, 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 but, no. But, but but it needs to be said. It does. Yeah. It does. Like, um, well, along with what I was saying before mm-hmm. about leaving was never an option for me, that is one of the pieces of advice I give to younger people who ask. I say the longer you stay here, all you're going to do is build more relationships and meet more people. And that is invaluable in getting to that next level. Because you can't get to that next level if people don't know who the hell you are. Mm -hmm. And so you have to meet them. You have to uh, try to get yourself in a position to meet these people. Whether it be at a party or at an audition or at a restaurant. (laughs) You have to... You have to be willing to embarrass yourself and put yourself out there mm-hmm. in a way that you're going to be rejected most of the time, but that's only most of the time, not all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that is my advice. It's, it's don't, don't be afraid of getting a little embarrassed. And when you talk about that rejection, I mean, how have you handled those so-called um, dark nights of the soul, where where maybe you question, am I going to surpass this level? Will I regress? Will I? W- am I going to get another audition? How do you how do you keep yourself going? Uh, I drink a lot <laughs> and um, I throw knives. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, only one of those is true. Um, uh, you know, I'm not a very dark guy in spite of of what i'm saying like i don't go to that dark place mm-hmm. um because i i never saw the point of it okay um i i you know i i only get upset when things go bad if it was something that i had control over gotcha but if if i've done everything in my part like if i have an audition and i put all my you know effort into learning the lines and working on the scenes and I go in and I give it my best and I don't get it there's no reason for me to get upset because I did everything I could possibly do it was out of my hands after that so if it doesn't go my way why should I get upset about it hmm. um, you know that that just seemed uh, silly to me and and I have other friends who get really upset when when you know they had an audition it didn't work out no nah, it should have been my part nah. I you know, just not my uh, not my game. We have um, Dresden Dolly. Please give my boy Sam Levine a huge hug from his biggest fan in the Midwest. Dresden Dolly is is lovely. She uh, <laughs> she uh, she at replies to me on my my Twitter page, which is at Sam Levine. Yes, indeed. S A M M L E V A N E. Two M's. That's right, two M's. And you know, and, and Kyle Dunnett has um, sent a question, but we're going to kind of touch on this. This is the direction we're heading in, so just just hang in there. But she um she said, or I think it's or I'm sorry, he he said um it's great to see in glorious bastards. So we're going to kind of come up on this here. W- w- where does Quentin Tarantino rank on your all-time directors list? Number one, no question about it. And 
here's uh, uh, a great little thing. When I booked Inglorious Bastards, a uh, uh, and I gave an interview talking about Quentin, someone dug up an old interview I had given almost ten years earlier. Mm. Uh, that someone asked me who is the director you want to work with more than anyone, and my answer was Quentin Tarantino on anything. Mm. And wow. uh, and so it's good to know uh, I am not a liar, nor have my tastes changed in a decade. <laughs> well, how did you learn of the audition? Um, I learned of the audition. Uh, I feel like I overheard uh, someone talking about. I was at a party, and I think I overheard people talking about how Quentin was going to start meeting young Jewish actors in L.A. Uh, for the the roles of the bastards, and it wasn't he wasn't going to read anyone; he was just doing general meetings mm-hmm. where you just go in and shoot the shit with him for ten minutes. So I, I guess first off, it helps that you're connected to the right kinds of people or partying with the right kinds of people that, that have this kind of information. Uh, I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> if, if, if you think about it that way. Um, yeah, I but. The story actually starts uh, with Inglorious Bastards about five years prior to that general meeting. Okay. I uh, let's see here. This goes back to what we were just talking about: being in the right place at the right time. Um, uh, I have known uh, Jimmy Kimmel for nine years now, mm-hmm. and uh, when he started his late night talk show in 2003, it became the coolest place to hang out in LA on the weeknights. The green room at his show is like a club. And um, and so I knew Jimmy, I knew Cousin Sal, I knew a lot of the people on the show. So any night I wanted to, I could go hang out at the green room and, and kind of watch the show from there, and that was a lot of fun. And uh, when I saw that Quentin was going to be a guest on one of the shows, I did not waste any time in... <laughs> letting Jimmy and company know that I wanted to come to the show that night so that I could meet Quentin. And uh, and so I went and hung out in the green room and took my time, and I knew that Quentin knew uh, the show Freaks and Geeks that I had been on because I knew Quentin was friends with uh, Judd Apatow. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of patiently waited in the green room for the right moment, and then I approached Quentin and struck up a conversation, and he knew who I was from the show, well, how how large is this green room, and how many people are in the green room? It's a pretty big green room, and at any given time, there's like 150 people in there. Oh, okay, wow. wow. Yeah, so it, it is a party atmosphere. Okay, I kid you a, not. It's a full party. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and so I waited for the right moment. We started talking about it, and then I went back to his dressing room with him, and we had a drink, and we talked for like 90 minutes about Freaks and Geeks, and he was promoting Kill Bill at that time, so we talked about that, and... Uh, yeah, we had a, uh, a a fun little encounter, and then uh, we actually wound up staying there so long that after the show had ended, that security came in and was like, "Guys, we don't want to kick you out, but we want to go home. <laughs> mm-hmm. So leave." Okay, so so it wasn't before that you talked to him after he came out of. Yeah, he had done his segment on the show and, and then came out and hung out afterward, and um, and then we walked outside, and as we were leaving, he said, "Hey, man, it was really great talking to you. I hope we can work together someday." And I said, "Yeah, that'd be that'd be all right." <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, five years later, there we were at that. I I got in that general interview, and he remembered that we'd met, and you know. But listen, yeah. I'm I'm curious how you know. So once once you're at this party and you hear you hear your your friends and they kind of mention, okay, Quentin's calling people in for the for these general meetings. You know, how, how do you go about, what channels do you go about to, to get yourself into a meeting with Quentin? Where, where, where do you uh, go through? Well, I called my manager. I have okay. an agent and a manager. Okay. And I called my manager and said, Quentin is meeting with young Jewish actors. Mm-hmm. Get me in on this now. <laughs> there is, I am not kidding around. You make this happen today. Yeah. And, uh, and they and made so, it happen for you. And they made it happen fairly quickly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, and from what I understand, so you, you sit in... It, it wasn't an audition right away. It's, it's just this meeting. Where, so t- yeah, t- just a general little... meeting. Uh, just, hey, what's going on? What are you up to? Mm-hmm. You know, um, so you're Jewish. You had a bar mitzvah. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. And because Quentin and, I knew, Quentin and I knew each other from, you know, years earlier, um, it wasn't a nice to meet you conversation. It was an, hey, so what's been going on mm-hmm. kind of kind of vibe. We talked about Freaks and Geeks and Jed Apatow and Undeclared. And, uh, and he requested all the actors bring in one or two uh, projects that they were proud of that they wanted him to see. And so I brought in 
um, an episode of uh, Veronica Mars that I had been on mm-hmm. that I, I was pretty proud of, and uh, I actually brought in a short film that I uh, uh, starred in that I was very proud of, and I put those on a DVD for him, and and so it was just really just kind of a a very loose, relaxed meeting. With a lot of the work that you book, is it done through relationships or is it mostly done through your agent and manager? I mean, it sounds like that was a special case. Yeah, it's about 85% oh, through uh-huh. my agent and manager. Um, but, you know, some of the, my fa- most favorite jobs I've, I've really ever gotten have been uh, relationship jobs from, you know, people that I knew before the, the job happened. and That's what led to it. Um, the, the movie Club Dread. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I was in, um, I I booked that because I had already worked with uh, J. Chandrasekhar, the director of that film, on uh, two episodes of Undeclared, mm-hmm. and so when th- that opportunity presented itself, I didn't really have to, you know, he he called me, he reached out to me because of that existing relationship. Mm-hmm. So so most of the auditions that you get are, are through your your agent or manager. Yes. How important do you think it is for an actor to build up uh, his or her audience? Uh, it's very important mm-hmm. because they, the fans, drive the marketplace. Mm-hmm. If uh, if suddenly nobody wants to go out and see uh, Tom Cruise movies, the studios are not going to give him twenty million dollars to keep making movies. So it's very important to to make sure that you have a fan base. But I guess it's more important to make sure you have a fan base that's actually going to go out and spend the money to see the things you're in, <laughs> because <laughs> well wishes are. Uh, or nice, good intentions. Oh, I'm a big fan. You know, I download all your stuff on the internet. Wait, what was that? <laughs> you don't actually pay for the. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks a bunch. Now, Sam, when I when I look you up online, I see a ton of interviews with Sam Levine and Inglorious Bastards linked together. Yes. Um, you know, and, and what happened, I guess, is your role was significantly cut down in the final product, from what I hear. Yeah. Um, and yet you were doing press as if you were one of the film's leads. With, right, which which I love and I admire. So you know, so you obviously made the decision that with Inglorious Bastards you were going to go out and get all the press that you could. Um, can you share with us the motivators behind this decision? Uh, sure. Well, the first motivator is when I started doing press for Inglorious Bastards, I had not seen the film mm-hmm. uh, in its in its finished uh, form. I knew what I had shot. Okay. And I had an idea of what the finished film would look like. Gotcha. So when I first started doing press, I did it under the impression that the bulk of what I shot would still be in the film. Okay. Um, and then after I saw the film uh, at the Cannes Film Festival and realized that most of what I had done was on the cutting room floor, um, and I still had all these interviews set up, I, I told my, my publicist, I was like, D- you know, do they, do they know? Do they care? And she was like, no, they are still happy to have you in there. And then I realized, you know, Brad Pitt can't do every interview promoting Inglorious <laughs> Bastards. Someone else has got to gotta do other interviews. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I was more than happy to, to, to do them because e- even if I only had, you know, a walk-on, if you just, you know, saw me carrying a gun in one scene, I would be happy to promote the movie because it's a great movie. And the fact that I got to work on it, even if it was just a day... Um, which it wasn't, but even if it, if it were, I would have been thrilled to get out there and promote it with everything I had because it, it is certainly my most high-profile project to date and a project that I'm very proud to have been a part of. Mm-hmm. So, you know, let's talk payoff. How, how has all this press, um, has it led to, you know, auditions, jobs, um, you know, has it paid off in any any kind of way? Um, you know, uh, that is that is a hard question to answer. Um it's it has led to um, I don't know that specifically the press that I've done has led to other things yet. I, I mean I don't know what the what the the root of it is if the film was just popular enough that people saw it and mm-hmm. knew I was in it. I don't know that they needed you know uh, to to you know hear me do an interview to know that I was in the the film. Mm-hmm. But um, maybe in terms of of fan base, mm-hmm. uh, it's helped. Um, I don't know professionally so far because I think all the, the the rooms that I've gone into and the people that I've seen since the film opened, um, they all told me how much they liked the film and you know how you know happy they were to see me in it and and I'm grateful for all that. But I don't I, I think all those people probably would have seen the film regardless. But in terms of fan base, uh, I think it's helped. And, and and coming back to your audition with with Quentin, you know, what is it like? When, when, you, when you actually 
when he says, you know what, after the general meeting, I, I want to bring you in, Sam. I, I want to actually audition you. Can, mm-hmm. can you can you take us there? Um, you know. Uh, oh you know, yeah. The, the, the well, number one. Yeah. Well, that in your book. Yeah. Can that. Tell us uh, about that. That general meeting was on a on a Friday afternoon, and uh, as I was driving home from that meeting, uh, I got the phone call from my manager saying that it went very well, and Quentin. They're going to send you a script, and they want you to read it, and then prepare some scenes, and come back in Monday and audition for Quentin. Mm-hmm. And uh, and originally, uh, he had me prepare and read for the role of Udovich, played by uh, B.J. Novak. Okay. And uh, and so I spent all weekend working on that. I called up uh, a writer-director friend of mine, mm-hmm. uh, and he helped me with it. And um, And so I went in Monday, and... We started doing the scene, and when I say we, I mean Quentin and me, um, which is very unusual. Most auditions, the director will sit there and watch you read with uh, either the casting director or an assistant. I've never been in a room where the director read the other lines with with wow. me. Um, so right there I knew, you know, oh, God, this is such a great project. Uh-huh. And... Um, and so we read Udovich stuff for about 10 minutes, and then Quentin said, you know what, I, I, I kind of want to see you read Donnie Donowitz. I want to see what that sounds like. Mm-hmm. And so he gave me the Donowitz sides, you know, the role played by Eli Roth. And so I looked over those for a minute or two, and I was familiar with them from reading the script, and, and then we started doing Donowitz scenes. And we did those for another 10 minutes or so. And I mean, we're up. We're on our feet. We're we're walking all around the room. We are staging this scene. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm in there almost a half hour just doing these scenes with him. And uh, and he says, you know what? That was great. I I, I think I saw everything I need. Thank you so much for coming in. I really appreciate it. I said, yeah, of course. (laughs) And I split. And then we don't hear anything for two weeks. Mm -hmm. I figure it's all over. And then I get the phone call that they want me to play Hirschberg. A role I did not read for. Of course. Wow. Now, w- w- you know, when you're doing these lines with him, do you, are, do you both have scripts in your hand? Yeah, we were both holding uh, sides, which are just okay, a couple so pages. You have the sides. The scripts, yeah. What kind of performance was was Quentin giving you? Was he was he really giving you something to work off? Of, oh or? yeah, he was as intense as as the guys who did the roles were. I mean, this is, that's his baby. Mm-hmm. He's not going to half ass it in there. He he never does. I'm just trying to imagine balancing that in terms of you know giving the performance and then and then having to be able to step back and, and analyze what you're doing as well. Um, well, that's why he's the mad genius. He can <laughs> do all of those things easily. There's one other thing I want to point out here, Sam. You know, in, in a previous interview, um, you had this quote, and I want to touch on this because I is, lie a lot in interviews. <laughs> by the way, this, this is something that, that that I actually was trying to put into words with Karen this week, mm-hmm. and then as I was getting prepared for this interview, I, I came across this quote, and I was hoping to get some maybe some commentary on this. Um, you said everyone has their own thing that only they can do. You know, there's got to be that the one character that comes up that when you play that character. You're the only person who could have played that character that way. And when that happens, when that magical click happens, the right actor finding the right part in the right film or television show, that's where I think you can get bumped up to the next level. Man, that's a good quote, huh? <laughs> Let's just take a moment to appreciate how meaningful that quote is. And I, I must have been drunk when I gave that one. Um, yeah, I, uh, I agree with what I said. My, my views on that have not changed since whenever I said that. You know, because I, I have a lot of friends that you know they're, they're pounding the pavement. You know what I mean? You know, mm-hmm. kind of like the you know some of the friends that you mentioned, where you know they're doing all they can. They're they're doing whatever they can to get the audition, get themselves in the room. And and they're doing whatever they can to, to get themselves to the next level. Mm-hmm. You know, it just you know, it, it, I I feel for you guys. I feel for actors and 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 the, and the struggle that's there. Um, you know, and, and and I love coming across this this quote of of fine. And do you feel like you you have have you found your your right role? Um, I don't know that I found the one. If the, what what when you read that back to me, it evoked. Maybe like a specific thing, mm-hmm. um, you know, like Jim Carrey as Ace Ventura. I mean, that when he played Ace Ventura, mm-hmm. prior to that, he was just the guy from In Living Color. When he did that role in that movie, mm-hmm. can you imagine anyone else doing Ace Ventura? No. <laughs> and it uh, it was the right actor in the right role in the right film, and mm-hmm. bam, he was a huge star after that. 
And so that's what I'm talking about when I mean the right actor finding the right part to mm-hmm. get to the next level. So I don't know that that specifically has happened to me yet, but certainly I've had a couple of, of roles. I mean, the role of Neil Schreiber on Freaks and Geeks, mm-hmm. um, you know, albeit 10 years ago now, was huge for me. Uh, prior to that, I was just a, a, an obscure, you know, New York actor mm-hmm. trying, you know, doing commercials and trying to get bit parts in, in whatever I could. And so, actually, I almost wanted to say that. I don't want people to think that, um, you know, I, I, I've gotten all these lucky breaks. I absolutely had my hard times when I started as an actor. Yes, I, I happened to be a teenager, but the, the struggle was, was still the same. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I struggled for over five years. Um, trying to get anywhere as an actor before I booked Freaks and Geeks. And if the pilot for Freaks and Geeks had not gotten picked up, I would probably still have stayed in New York for a long time after that working at it because I would not have... I, I don't know that I would have had the, the gumption to move to L.A. Mm-hmm. then, I, you know. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's... Uh, and, and how much work... You know, because you know you have over fifty jobs that you've booked as an actor. Mm-hmm. How many would you attribute to Freaks and Geeks? You know, how how big has that been for you? Um, wow. I I, I mean, uh, you know, if I'm uh, from from an ego standpoint, I want to say none. <laughs> I want to say I have booked every job since then on my own accord, on my own awesome talent. But I don't know. I mean, uh, I know uh, I know Quentin was a big Freaks and Geeks fan, mm-hmm. so. I'm sure that played uh, no small part in, you know, getting him to consider me for for Bastards. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's not often uh, once you get cast in something, someone will say, uh, oh, I cast you in this because I really loved you in Freaks and Geeks. You know, I mean, they might think it, but uh, I've never really heard anybody say that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I couldn't I couldn't say. I got you. Mm -hmm. I got you. Um, you know, so we're heading we're heading into our our last couple minutes. My God, is know, it really? Yeah. We just <laughs> I could talk all day. I should charge for this like that Kevin Smith does. You know, ha- has this conversation, this dialogue that we're having here in the studio, ha- has it evoked any additional thoughts? You know, anything you want to leave to anyone that, that's going to be tuning in here listening? Yeah, I really feel like I haven't cursed or said enough foul things. <laughs> um, I really haven't disgusted you guys, which is which is my goal on a Sunday morning. Um, I mean, I had, whole, I had a whole riff on anal bleaching I was going to go into, and I have to forget about that now. Um, no, I, uh, I don't know. I, I, I guess uh, I'm, I'm worried that I made it sound really bleak, and I don't want to discourage any uh, young people who, who are considering acting. Um, but I, I, I definitely will stress it is the hardest uphill battle of your life um, in terms of you know uh, uh, a career mm-hmm. trying to to build yourself as an actor it is it is not easy the setbacks can be very uh, painful um, but you know like like Harrison Ford said leaving can't be an option if it's an option at all do anything else with your life I say mm-hmm. because you will have more fun well said well said we appreciate your uh, realism so, well, we've been speaking with actor Sam Levine. Sam, thank you so much. You know, time has flying or flown by so fast, and um, you've mentioned that you have numerous uh, pieces of uh, press on yourself. Where should people go if they want to find out more about you? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know. Find me on Twitter or Facebook, uh, or uh, I should really set up some sort of web page for that, shouldn't I? Okay. So IMDb. IMDb has a list of uh, some some films that I have coming out uh, uh, next year. One of them is out right now on IFC On Demand. It's called Made right. for Each Other. Um, right. Hopefully people can check that out. And I have another film called Drones coming out next year. Okay. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. So that, right. that's Sam with two M's. So that's Sam, right. Sam that's Levine. Right. You can find I think it's just like that on Twitter. Oh. Sam, Le- you know, at Sam Levine. Mm-hmm. And I guess look them up on, on Facebook as well. Sam, okay. thank you for yeah, joining thank us you very in the studio. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you again for joining us this Sunday. This has been another episode of Film Courage on LATalkRadio.com. Have a great week.